Is it only when the the chalk holder would be in motion, or when it's still? Is it also like? Uh, I believe you would say that everything uh, at all points has both wave and particle characteristics. That's right. Um, for one thing, remember there's no such thing as something that's really at rest, right? Uh, yeah. Everything is in motion yeah. compared to some reference point, right? For example, this isn't at rest. It's moving along with the rotating Earth, and it's being carried around the sun in revolution. So in a sense, I'm there's... Sure yeah. that in a wave, I guess. Pardon? So. Well, um, let's see. Uh, I don't know if we want to get into, uh, let's see, all the details there. So you're saying, how can you have something that's not moving and still have it, uh, and still consider it to be a wave? Because a wave always seems like it's moving from one place to another, right? Yeah. Well, there's that concept of standing waves, oh, yeah. right? Um, which kind of are in the same place, basically. So, so, um, so I'm not sure if I know 100% uh, myself what the best way to explain that is. But I think that... Um, even if you're kind of considering something. Well, another way to put it is nothing can ever be absolutely at rest, partly for that reason. Yeah. Um, you can never measure something as being uh, exactly at rest because of its wave characteristics. Okay. All right, I don't know if I'm, if I'm explaining that so great, though. Maybe I don't understand that so well myself. Okay. All right, so uh, let's see where we are right now. So um, we've got a bigger wavelength, and a smaller wavelength acts like a particle. Um, so what that means is... Suppose that we have something that has a small wavelength. If it has a very small wavelength, is this bending phenomenon going to be important or not important? Yeah, not important, because it's really acting more like a particle. Say, like this bullet. The wavelength of this bullet is so small, relatively speaking, that we can just treat it as moving in a straight line. We don't treat it as bending at all, basically. Okay. Um, so um, it's only the bending it only tends to be important when the wavelength is uh, quite big. Now, I keep saying that the, what matters is how big the wavelength is relative to something else. So I think what would matter here is how big the wavelength was relative to the slit we were talking about. Everything is relative to something else. So if the wavelength here is small relative to the slit, uh, then I think the bending uh, phenomenon would not be too important here. Okay. All right. So um, we've uh, used, so we've seen, uh, uh, we've used Huygens principle to explain two things. Um, so again, Sweden's principle says that every point on the wavefront is like a source of a new spherical wave. And we use that to explain um, why a plane wave stays planar, because the tangent to the spheres stays planar. But we've also used that to explain why when the plane wave goes through a slit, it bends at the edges, because there's nothing to balance out the curves at the edges over here. There's no new point slit. Uh, and this shows, in general, why we have diffraction, why waves bend when they go through barriers. And we also showed how that's different from uh, uh, a particle, which would not bend when it goes through a barrier. Um, and again, these types of bending phenomena are important when the wavelength is relatively big compared to the other parts of the system. Okay, now, and there's also some things you asked me that I don't think I understood too well, but those are the stuff that I understand pretty well. Okay, now I'm um, continuing on with Huygens' principle. So before we were talking about a planar wave front, uh, but now let's say that we have a spherical wave front. So here we have a spherical wave front. Um, now, technically, it's the sphere would extend in both directions, but again, I only want to focus on the forward movement, so I'm not going to draw the back half of the sphere. Now, let's forget about Huygens' principle for a second. If we have a spherical wave front, if this is what it looks like at one instant, what's it going to look like a little time later? Well, I think it's kind of intuitive that it's going to spread out like this. Yeah. Uh, maybe for a second I will draw both sides of the spheres. So These aren't really spheres on the board, but they're supposed to be perfect. Yeah, that's terrible. All right, these are supposed to be two perfect spheres with the same center. That's a terrible picture, but these are supposed to be two spheres with the same center. Okay. All right, so a little better. Okay, um, 
um, so if this is the before wavefront, this would be the after wavefront. So it's moving out in all directions like this. Um, and then if we wait a little bit longer, it'll be an even bigger sphere. So we just keep getting expanding spheres. I can only draw the circular cross-section, but there's really a whole big three-dimensional sphere. Okay. Now, um, this is, again, I think, common sense. That if you have a spherical wavefront, it expands as a sphere. This is what you would get from a point source, right? right. So, for example, if there was like a little light bulb here. Can I draw? I don't know. I can't draw a light bulb. But if there's a little light bulb here, um, the light would keep emerging from it uh, in all directions, pretty much, uh, in a sphere. Or, say, if you drop a rock in a pond. Well, you know that if you drop a, drop a rock in the middle of a pond, you can see the ripples, the waves, moving out in spheres um, around it, just a steadily expanding sphere. So another good test question would be, so we know that um, when you have a spherical wavefront, it propagates as a new spherical wavefront. And a good test question would be, use, use drawings and Huygens principle to explain why a spherical wavefront expands as a new spherical wavefront. So here's a portion of the sphere. So now I'm only going to draw the front half of the sphere for simplicity. All right, so here's the before picture of the sphere. All right, and now we're going to use Huygens' principle, so we're going to select a point on this to be a point source for a new spherical wavelet. So now I'm going to draw a new spherical uh, wavelet uh, around that point, kind of like this. All right, and then I'm going to choose uh, a new point to be a new spherical wavelet. So each of the points here is providing uh, a new, is like they're a point source for a new spherical wave. And then we can choose another point over here and have it, have it also be providing a new spherical wave, let, and then another point over here. And that's also like also providing its own spherical wave, let. Obviously, there's an infinite number of points here, but you just choose a couple evenly spaced representative examples here. And again, Huygens' principle says we can take all these points on the original. So all these, uh, this curve here with the points, that was the original wavefront. This curve with the points, this is the before wavefront. And then how do we get the new wavefront? Well, we pick a bunch of representative points, and we treat them as if they were point sources for new spherical wavelets. And now, where is the new combined wavefront going to be? It should be the tangent to all of these. And if I were a good drawer, we would get a new, bigger sphere. The key thing is you can see, clearly, the new wavefront now will still be curved. Clearly, we're going to still get a new combined wavefront. So remember, the combined wavefront is just the tangent to all the little wavelets. The combined wavefront is just the tangent to all the little wavelets. So now we've confirmed our intuition. It was already intuitive to us that if we start with um, a spherical wavefront, it's going to expand into a bigger spherical wavefront. And now we can use Huygens principle to explain how that is with our pictures uh, over here. And a second ago, we also saw that if you have a planar wavefront, that propagates as a new planar wavefront, even though the wavelets are spheres, because the tangent would be um, uh, flat, except at the edges where it bends. All right. Um, so uh, that would give us that. So now we've used Huygens' principle to explain the propagation of a planar wave and Huygens' principle to explain the propagation of a spherical wave. Okay. Uh, so those are two important points. So they have good pictures of these in your book here on that same page.
uh, better pictures than I could put on the board. So these would be good things to study how to draw. So if you had it, if you actually, uh, like I said, this would be a good exam question for him to, he likes saying things like explain with pictures, blah, blah, blah. So these would be good pictures to be able to come up with on your own. Uh, so you can kind of see how they did that and how they spaced everything to kind of have everything come out nice and neat, basically. Okay. All right, so, uh, yeah, and what the caption here is, fi this figure shows how Huygens' principle accounts for the propagation of plane and spherical waves. So a good test question would be, use pictures and Huygens' principle to account for the propagation of plane and spherical waves. So we just did both of those. Even though the wavelets are, so the key thing is, even though each of these individual wavelets is always spherical, the overall wave could still be planar if the tangent is flat. 